So, uh, this is my lab. This is the, the people that do all the work that I'm going to talk about. And this is a guy who used to be in the Rust lab who has also contributed to this. So, as you may have figured out from the name of my lab, I'm Jana Bromberg, and um, we're going to talk about variant effects. You guys are mostly biology, right? Not more computer science or... Or yeah, yeah, but you are more biology oriented than CS, is that correct? Yes. On, on what kind of uh, we can choose to delve into different subjects? You can still choose or are you at this point done <laughs> choosing? We have more informatics. You're more informatics, okay. So everybody knows what bubble sort is and, and how to use, uh, okay, neural nets, so great. Then we're gonna be good. All right, so let's start. I like to motivate my talks um, and uh, I, I find Mikhail Bulgakov, who is the author of this masterpiece, to be one of the best writers that had existed in recent history. Highly recommend the book called Master and Margarita. It's translated into about 400 languages or so. I didn't realize there were 400 languages, but you know. Um, okay, in this particular storyline, uh, there is a devil. And this guy comes to the devil and uh, asks him some story the devil is not interested in. And the devil asks the guy, a regular mortal like most of us are, uh, when are you going to die? And the guy gets all flustered and says, well, nobody knows and it's nobody's concern. And the devil's uh, servants are always very kind. So they basically says, sure, nobody knows. He'll die in nine months next February of liver cancer in the clinic of the first Moscow State University in ward number four. So my argument is that for the past many years, at least 30 that we've got, you know, these new technologies, what we've been trying to do is what the devil's servants have been trying to do, is to answer the question of what is the disease that this person is going to have and what is its progression. Okay, how is it going to progress? How fast? And so on and so forth. So in order to be able to do this, we need to first answer the question which most of us don't think about, what is disease? So we're going to have this as a participatory class since it's small enough. What is disease? Uh, um, uh, an abnormality in metabolic processes. In metabolic processes. Or in any kind of process that is in the cell. So either it might be exaggerated or it might be subdued. Mm -hmm. or so when you have a broken leg, that's not a disease? No, no, that is, that is merely a mechanical um, Dysfunction. Okay, but then so inflammation that is caused by a broken leg that changes the metabolic processes in your cells is what? Well, that might be a disease. Okay, but, so... But the breaking of the leg is not the disease. The disease is caused by... Well, the, the whole, the broken leg is a syndrome, right? So it's a disease, right? So a disease, as defined by Merriam-Webster dictionary, is a condition of a living animal or plant body, or one of its parts, uh, that impairs normal functioning and is typically manifested by distinguishing signs and symptoms. So as lung cancer, as liver cancer, as diabetes, as Alzheimer's, as a broken leg, they are all diseases. Okay, but you are very correct. So I really appreciate the fact that uh, you mentioned that you need to have a change of normal. Okay, so disease is actually defined with reference to normal. In order to observe disease, you have to have a normal baseline. Normal baseline will be different if you are in New York or in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, the normal baseline will be different. Think about fevers, for instance, which are distinguishing some, uh, signs of certain disorders. If you have a particular fever, which is good, you know, considered good, in um, you know super cold, I don't know, Greenland winter. Right. is not necessarily the same fever as what would be the fever in super hot Sahara. Right? So this is important. You need to define the baseline, you need to define the amount of change, and you need to define the direction of change in order to be able to define disease. These are things that most people don't talk about. You know, I have a cold, I have a disease. 
you know, I have, uh, I don't know, multiple sclerosis, I have a disease. They're all diseases, but you need to define them very specifically in order to be classified as disease. But, so the way that we define it is via the impairment of normal functionality. And uh, so one of the things that, uh, that you could impair is the simplest pathway, is the folic metabolism pathway. And the reason I say it's simplest is because if you look at the pathways that you would find in the cell, you usually don't, they usually don't fit on a page. Or they will fit, but they, you can't read the names of things, right? So the idea is that this is the simplest, or maybe if you know a simpler one, let me know. But this is the simplest pathway that I know of. This has 19 components. Right? So that's all. That's all you need to do this pathway. And the weird part about this pathway is that it's responsible, the malfunction in this pathway is responsible for a range of diseases, anything from heart disease to cancer and um, anemia. So completely unrelated things right, that, that can be related via malfunction of this pathway. In fact, a lot of pregnant women are told to be taking a lot of supplements of folic acid. And this is part of the reason why they are, because it ensures normal functionality of their body and of the fetus that they're carrying. So uh, my, my computer, for some reason, remembered the timing. But um, what I would like you to focus on is uh, uh, how we can break this pathway because this is about disease and you know we're talking about malfunctioning of the pathway. So one of the things that I want to point out is this enzyme over here, DHFR, is a dihydrofolate reductase, right, that takes either folic acid and converts it to, to dihydrofolate or takes dihydrofolate as a dietary folate and converts it then into the tetrahydrofolate pathway, into the tetrahydrofolate uh, substance. So if we take this DHFR and we wanted to disrupt this pathway, the easiest way would be to disrupt the function of DHFR. Okay? Okay. So in order to talk about protein function disruption, I, I'd like to sort of point out that protein function comes in a variety of things, right? There's lots of different protein functions. So the one that you obviously see there, DHFR, is an enzyme. In fact, most of the functions of the cell, the largest variety, in terms of the number of things that you can do, are accounted for by enzymes. But there's also antibodies, contractile proteins, transport proteins, regulatory proteins, and uh, structure and storage proteins. So enzymes by no means define everything that our cell can do. Okay, just keep this in mind. All right, so... Let's focus on our DHFR. How can I disrupt the function of DHFR? It's the structure. How do I disrupt its function? Cutting one of the loops. So by changing the structure. Do you know for sure that that will change the function? Which one of the loops would I need to cut in order to, to change the function? The one with the binding side. Which one is that? Well, Sorry? Well, that's a good question. I don't know, but... Uh, what does it look like? If I had to guess, I'd, I'd take the yellow. This? Yeah. So that's the binding site. I know. Ah, okay. See, so this is, this is really kind of cool. It's a guessing game. Nobody can tell you anything from this structure, so don't, don't be um, sort of... Uh, I'm discouraged. So the one thing that I can tell you for sure is that many, many proteins, actually the vast majority of enzymes, right, are going to function in a way Pac-Man functions. So those of you who are old enough or now have a, you know, a back, throw, throwback of the Pac-Man story was this yellow thing that runs around and eats little pills. That's how most proteins look, right? So it's kind of two domains and then you get a binding site in the middle. So what looks like a binding site here? This thing, right? So that's, that's exactly it. In fact, uh, we will get back to, um, I will show you where the ligand fits in there. So that's the sequence. Can't really tell much from the sequence either. In order to be able to tell things from the sequence, you need to either use prediction methods. So basically say, okay, this is a binding site. This is a post-translational modification site, and so on and so forth. Uh, in order to do that, what do I need to do? I need to take the sequence and align it to what? 
You guys are bioinformaticians. To similar sequences. To similar sequences from where? From, from, from its family. What's, what's its family? Uh, <laughs> yeah? Basically, uh, its family are similar, <coughs> similar sequences, so you basically you have to define how close, um, um, <coughs> how close sequences you want to have to that are similar, and basically if you want to have a binding site, what you can look for is um, conservation, mm -hmm. with the binding site, if they are really similar and strict, they probably have the same function, and then probably this one bit, the binding site, is something of the most important bit about the function, so we could guess that the conserved sequence, the conserved residues are in the binding site. This is really curious. It's correct uh, to a large extent. Uh, most of this talk will be about our assumptions. Uh, in terms of conservation and, and so on and so forth. So this is a great intro. You're right, you would align it to similar sequences. You didn't answer which similar sequences uh, would make up its family. Uh, but in the end, that's what you do. You align them to, in order to identify things that are conserved, which are probably going to be significant, right? But why are they significant? Why is the things that are conserved, why are the things that are conserved significant? What does conservation mean? What does sequence similarity mean? This is a really important question if you're going to answer um, any of these larger structural questions. Yeah? Probably because they are functional, because they are important parts of the protein, uh, which yeah, shouldn't be kind of tampered with. Like, if, it's, um, if there are regions that are not functional, that do not really have a certain, a very important purpose, then you can mutate them and it wouldn't be. So do they mutate in one person? Or in one organism, or yeah, how? What is what does conservation mean? They're important. Where you can just answer. Yes, so, um, no, 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 no. The thing is, um, well, basically, you have to remember that every protein that does not really work correctly is sort of um, removed. From where? From the gene pool, basically, because... What does evolution act on? Selective pressure. No, that, that's the same thing, but what does it act on? Survival. Sorry? Survival in the end. Of what? Of what? Of what? So this is, this is a very basic question, guys. You align similar sequences because you believe they have come from the same ancestral gene, right? So there was an ancestor of this, these genes that existed in some organism that may or may not be alive today, right? where evolution was acting on the survival of this organism, not on the function of the protein. Does that make sense? Right? So families of proteins are abstract concepts. They're basically means of representing the evolutionary experiment on one single gene. right? So this, there is no such thing as a family. It's one that has evolved overall. That's why we call it family. Do, do, do you understand? Is this clear? And this is the only reason why the conservation argument works. Because if the same thing exists in every single version of the active protein, of the active gene, that means that this thing is important, whether for binding or for post-translational modification of structures and so on and so forth. This, this is very basic and I think most of you will understand this, you know, underneath, but you need to be able to formulate this. Why does this work? The pressure is on the organism, not on the gene. Right? So you could get away with some malfunctional proteins and still be an organism. Yeah? Okay. So now, let me tell you this, these are mutations for which there has been shown experimentally that there is effect, and uh, all kinds of varied effects. So the leucine in position 23 mutated to phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, arginine, the uh, phenylalanine in position 32, and so on and so forth, right? In sequence, these things are not very close to each other, but they kind of have this huge variety of problems that they can cause. Decreased affinity for NADP and dihydrofolate over tenfold decreased, right? Decreases affinity for uh, methotrexate and decreases catalytic rate by 200-fold, okay? 
as compared to 200 fold, do we really care about the catalytic rate for five fold change? Right? Does that matter? Does evolution care if that changes that much? So why do we see, why do we think that this is a mutation that has a functional effect versus this is a mutation that has a functional effect? Right? And then there is other things, increases affinity for, or no effect on affinity for NADPH, but increases affinity for dihydrofolate. Which one is the important function? In which organism? Do you see? All of these are questions that you need to answer in order to say that this is a successful evolutionary protein or not. But sort of to get back to this point, L23, F32, Q36, and N65, where do you think they are, given that I told you that the binding site is probably here? They disrupt catalytic activity, they disrupt binding. Where do you think the, the, these variants are? In a binding site. Somewhere next to a binding site. Makes total sense, right? And that they are. They are next to the binding site. Okay. That's the binding site, there is the ligand that's bound. You can see these variants are specifically affecting the binding site. Okay, so disease variants must be there as well, right? These things must be associated with disease. Well, except we don't know that they are. We've never seen disease that's associated with these types of mutations. What we have seen is disease that's associated with LATF and D153V. V. And you know where those variants are? Nowhere near the catalytic site. So what are those variants doing? And that disease, by the way, is actually quite difficult. It's a, it's a megaloblastic anemia. And it can manifest in, in things from severe developmental delay and generalized seizures in infancy to childhood absence epilepsy with learning difficulties. And get this, to no effects, no symptoms. How is that a disease if it has no symptoms? It's not, right? So this disease with lack of symptoms is not a disease by our definition. I don't, I don't, but in the first part of the sentence it says clinical features include variable neurologic symptoms to lack of symptoms, so there, are, there is like this range of... Exactly, exactly, so at some point you, this is back to the baseline, what is normal? Huh? How much change? Lack of symptoms is no disease. So if they say, you know, two, two lack of symptoms from here to here, are you here still a disease? Well, I don't know. You, you encourage us to take wild guesses, I, I guess, so... I don't encourage you to take wild guesses. I, I encourage you to take informed guesses. All right, but so, so maybe the lack of symptoms is due to uh, another variant in, in the makeup and the genetic makeup of the protein of people who don't have these symptoms that will like negate the effects of the mutation yeah so you can have compensatory mutations that's for sure but uh, so that's not what i asked that's that's true but that's not what i asked to, to to come to what you asked so what does the mutation do well it might just disrupt the overall um structure like in, a, in a, i don't know if it's the right word but allosteric way so due to the mutation back there um, the whole structure just changes ever so slightly that um, the binding will be disrupted. So my original question was uh, about whether this, if this is the no symptoms and this, and we are here on this range, is this still disease? Okay. <laughs> that and to our definition and to that of Webster's, no. No, well, that's, that's not quite true. There is a threshold. We have to design a threshold. Disease without symptoms is still a disease. No, so I'm saying this is... No, according to Webster, it's not. Yeah, but we're not Webster. We're bioinformatics. So if we have a misfunction of a protein, which does not result in any visible symptoms, that doesn't mean that the proteins function correctly. It's still... Well, what does that have to do with disease? Disease is an abnormality in the organism. No, disease is an abnormality in the organism which leads to problems. You could have a superpower 
let's see if it leads to problems in 30 years duration and then it suddenly starts leading to problems. Uh, so you could also have things that it are is, only problems it is in... It's a disease throughout the whole period. It's not a disease only no. after it becomes... No, that's not true. But nothing has changed in the organism in the cause of the disease. Let's say the protein only starts manifesting itself later. Uh, so what you're saying is that malfunction of the protein is not the same thing as disease, and that I agree with. Precisely. That, but that has nothing to do with the, the word disease, right? So the word disease, if you go to a doctor and you say, I have a disease, but I have no symptoms, he's going to oh, send no, you from home. From the standpoint of the doctor, <laughs> yes. they're symptomatic. Sorry? Do doctors are symptomatic. Yeah, but they treat... We aren't. We look at the... Doctor. You do not have a disease until you have a disease. Yes. That's, that's the bottom line. So you, that's well, so that's what you're arguing against. You're saying you have a disease the entire time, but you only manifest it at the end of your life. So let's say... At the symptoms. Yeah, well, so then you say, but you say you have the disease and the symptoms only come at the end of your life. That is not having a disease. You only have a disease once you have the symptoms. No. Yes. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Uh, it's sort of a good return because I think from a sort of bioinformatician, biochemistry point of view, it doesn't make sense to say it has to have symptoms because when you try to understand it, you have to sort of look at the core of the disease or of the what causes it, and so it makes more sense to, from so, a standpoint, what is the call that disease, even if on the larger organism scale it's not. So disease requires an environment, right? So if your argument is that disease can only manifest with age, that means that there has to be some accumulation of other things in the environment that cause the disease, given your background. Therefore, you do not have the disease while it has not accumulated. Look, if you like the definition, fine. So I, I it's not about me liking the definition. It's not about me liking the definition. It's either you have a disease or not. I think I know where we are, where we are having in this communication. So what Anton is maybe referring to is uh, sequencing somebody and then seeing that they have a variant of a known um, disease mutation. While uh, your argument may be yes, but as long as we are not having, as long as we are not having, um, I understand the argument. Data, as long as we don't have expression data, we cannot say where is the difference from the baseline. I understand the argument. Question forward: mm -hmm. What is the difference between symptoms and disease? Uh, a disease is an accumulation of symptoms. Yeah, but let's say <laughs> symptoms are multiple symptoms. That's a syndrome, and that's still a disease. So what is the difference between syndrome and disease? None. Then there's no point in having a different word for it. Okay, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's fine. That's all, that's all, all, look, all of us, believe it or not, are work, walking around with SNPs, with variants, which are associated with monogenic disorders. And that means 100% penetrance, except we're not sick. Can I you would die before the disease? For instance. Well, I didn't say we were sick. Well, <laughs> but <laughs> I mean, look, if you are arguing that the biophysical manifestations are the things that, manif that are disease, I'm telling you, biophysical manifestations only happen as symptoms, right? So there is absolutely no way to diagnose disease, disease, existing disease, not predisposed, but disease, without symptoms. So if you're saying, one very good example is CTE, this traumatic um, encephalopathy disorder, which is basically, you know, in the United States, there's lots of football players that get it, or Muhammad Ali is a good, a good example of this thing. So the idea is that if you get punched in the head, a lot, right? Some people will develop a problem with their uh, brains, right? And some will not. And the disease, the predisposition to disease is specific to those people who will develop the disease. But if they don't get punched in the head a lot, they won't develop the disease. So the fact that they are predisposed to a disease doesn't mean they have disease. But would you call them healthy? Yes. I would call them healthy, because for no intents and purposes, if they're not getting punched in the head, they're unhealthy. No, I, I see your point. I see your point. Okay. Um, but this, by the way, should be used as an example of what happens. You need a threshold for calling someone healthy or not healthy, 
right? Or you need a threshold for calling change of function or no change of function. You need to say this is change and this is not change in order to be able to do anything. So what my question was that you did not answer is if this is no symptoms and this is really difficult, really big symptoms, what if you are here, right? Is that disease? And that's a question. And that's a question that we need to answer, okay? In order to make any calls. Okay, so um, about structure of these things, I don't know. It looks, so the problem with 2D space is that it looks like that variant is internal. It's not, it's on the other side of the protein that's external. So I don't know if it changes function or not. We don't know. I haven't, you know, really looked into this. Um, but it is associated with disease and how it's associated with disease is also a big question. How do we know that this is a disease associated variant? And this is usually done on large scale studies where you say, okay, there is a bunch of people who have this variant who have a disease. And then you do a molecular study of the particular gene in order to try to build a model of molecular malfunction. Does that make sense? Okay. So the only point that I was trying to make here is disease is not equal to disruption of function. Okay? So sometimes you have disruption of function that does not give you disease, and sometimes you have disease where there is no disruption of function, and I will argue that point soon. Um, okay. There is also a point about disruption of function and disruption of structure. So we know this variant in L23, L23R, actually disrupts function quite significantly. That's the structure of the wild type protein. This is the structure of the non-wild type protein. That's the one that has the arginine in this position. Can you tell that there is a structural disruption? Not really, right? And in most cases where you have a variant that affects a position that is exposed, you will not be able to easily tell that there is a structural disruption. There may still be one, because just because you don't see it in the picture doesn't mean there isn't one. Okay? There's definitely one. So they are slightly different. I have the feeling on the left side, the binding side is slightly um, bigger. You can see it also in the lower loops. They are, they are different crystals, right? But I wanted to ask about this. So, uh, since proteins are moving in mm -hmm. solution, this disruption of structure, is it significantly more than what the protein moves by itself? And that's, that's another thing, right? So what is the measure of resolution that you can get to given a particular um, technique. So, for instance, these are crystal structures. What do you need to do for a crystal? You need to freeze the protein into a crystal, right? So it doesn't move, but it still moves but not so much, right? So the, to answer your question, in this particular case, the movements of the proteins within one structure is probably not going to be very significant, right? But these are two different proteins. One is mutated and one is not, right? And they are done separately in different batches. You can't expect that even if I get a, uh, a picture of this same thing in the same lab by the same people, it will look exactly like that. Right, so it will look exactly what it looks like when it freezes at that point. And this and this are not disrupted structures. I can show you two proteins that unfold, and there you can tell that the structure is disrupted. In this case, you cannot. It doesn't mean that there is no effect. It's just you can't tell using this particular technology. Okay? Is that clear? All right. Um, all right. So then uh, the other thing is this notion of fitness. And this is the other point that we were trying to sort of address when we were talking about selection pressure. Right? So fitness is how fit is a particular group of organisms that have that particular variant as compared to the group of organisms that don't have that particular variant. So it's really nearly impossible to do in humans because you can't really experiment with fitness of humans. right? But uh, you can do this in E. coli. So, for instance, the E. coli DHFR looks like this, quite similar. It's, it is a very different sequence and a somewhat different structure, but it's quite similar uh, overall, right? And you can tell that uh, these loops and these positions are somehow similar, right? 
So we focus on the three variants in the E. coli here, and we ask the question, do variation, does variation in this position actually have an effect on fitness? And for that, we measure not only fitness, which is the total number of cells given a particular stress, right, but also the catalytic efficiency, right? So this is one of the things that we want the HFR to have, right? It wants to um, create dihydrofolates or tetrahydrofolates, remember. Okay, so the blue line here, the blue bar here and the line here is the wild type. This is what the normal E. coli DHFR functions as. This has drug resistance, which is the proxy for um, fitness, right? And this is the catalytic efficiency. So what you see is that uh, whatever metrics are, at 16 of wild type is the catalytic efficiency, and 0 0.9 is the drug resistance, okay? And what you see is then that with the mutant P21L, what you are getting is increased catalytic efficiency, but about the same, slightly more, in terms of drug resistance, okay? You can say it's about the same, you can say it's slightly more, right? But catalytic efficiency versus drug resistance is somewhere there. And then with the other two mutations, what you're seeing is that catalytic efficiency is decreased, so 16 to 7, but the drug resistance increased from 0 0.9 to 8. Right? So catalytic efficiency is decreased if, and fitness is increased. And the same thing goes for the other uh, variant, right? So 7.7 .7 is a decreased catalytic efficiency and drug resistance is 29, so it's increased, okay? So you see that it doesn't have to be that function actually correlates to fitness. Does that make sense? Okay, fine. So. In overall, to sort of summarize what we just talked about, is th this is the space of all variants, and I don't know if this is to scale, I can't really estimate this, but um, there is no effect for certain variants, for a certain set of variants. And again, you have to define the threshold for which you say there is no effect, right? You have to say that this is no effect, whereas that is effect, okay? And then, for that, there is some variants that have no effect, some variants that have an effect on function, some variants that have an effect on fitness, and these may overlap largely, and some variants that cause disease. And disease variants will overlap with fitness and function. But there is a large, um, well not large, but a significant difference between them. Right? So there is some fitness variants that have no effect on function, and there are some disease variants that don't fall into either of these. So how does that work? Anybody know? So why would there be variants that have an effect on fitness, but not on function? Because, oh no, wait. How do you define function? What do you mean? So, um, if it uh, enhances catalytic activity, that would be an effect on function, right? Well, any effect on function. So, function of one single protein, or whatever it does. So, fitness in this sense is resistance to antibiotics. For instance. For instance okay. So, we change the protein, but, but the original function remains the same. And yet, the fitness goes up. So, the hypothesis would be that we actually add a function to the protein, which does not interfere with the original function. So the fun is that possible? So, the fun that, would, that would count as a function. It is possible, oh, function. but it would count as a function change. It's not a very straightforward answer, so I've spent some time thinking about this. <laughs> so, you may well, not... A yeah. very weird roundabout hypothesis would be that if we change the constitution of the protein, then its synthesis does no longer require an amino acid from the chain, which has been blocked by the antibiotics. Thereby, but this is very. This is great. This is this is one of the. It, it happens more often than you would think. Really? Yes. Uh, the other thing that also happens is, um, you change the codon that codes for the amino acid. It still has the same amino acid. So there is a mutation, but it's on the genetic level, right? And now this mRNA that's encoding this protein is no longer stable, 
right? So you, your function of the protein is still the same, but you now have significantly less of the protein because the mRNA doesn't actually make it there. Or let's say the mRNA is stable, but the codon is inferior in terms of translation rate, right? So all of these things, these external things could in fact affect fitness but not function of the protein. On the other hand, if you look here, so this disease, you would assume that disease affect fitness, right? So if you are not, so fitness is usually counted in terms of the number of reproductive children, right? So how well are you at reproduction? And so if you die at the, of your disease at age 10, you never have kids. Right? So that's a fitness disadvantage. On the other hand, if you have a disease like Huntington, which doesn't manifest until you're over the age of 50, then you can have children, and so it's a very sad story, but you have children, right? So it has no effect on fitness, but it's still a disease variant. And this is back to where and when your disease manifests, okay? So for all intents and purposes, when you have children, you are healthy. By the time that you manifest disease, you're post-reproductive age. So usually if you've had kids, you've had kids at this point. Okay? All right. So how do I know that function is disrupted? Death. Death. <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one, yes. Uh, you could get hit by a car. That's not function disruption. <laughs> How do I know that function is, disruption, is disrupted? Experimentally, it's actually like this, right? So you have some experiment where you can see this is red, this is yellow, this is green for some whatever functionality. And I'm, I'm being very abstract right now, but this is how you look at it. Uh, computationally, you do this. And I'm sort of very uh, partial to this particular method because the original version of SNAP was my PhD thesis. So basic idea is that you submit a protein sequence and we can tell you from that sequence what effect the variants have, okay? All right, so as an aside on SNPs, since uh, you guys are from informatics, not from the biology side, just to make sure everyone is on the same page, most existing computational methods focus on single amino acid substitutions, why? This is definitely not the only form of mutation that's out there. However, most common mutations are single nucleotide polymorphisms, right? And they account for about 99% of all mutations in the human genome, okay? So non-synonymous SNPs, which are trivially a much smaller subset, so there's about 10,000 of them in every human genome as compared to reference, and non-synonymous SNPs are the ones that cause single amino acid substitutions in protein sequence. And this is the things that most people focus on, okay? All right, so what is important for protein function, for predicting protein functional effects? What do you think? We discussed some of these things. We just discussed them. <laughs> yeah? And basically, if the mutation is in the binding site, it's oh. probably has something, or if it's just some sort of important bit that um, defines a protein structure. So you got two of them at the same time. So proximity to the functional site is really a very important thing. So if I was trying to identify, so I know that L23R has a functional effect. Experimentally, I know this. But let's say I wanted to figure this out computationally. How would I go about it? I would say, okay, fine. Let me get the human DHFR. Look at that L23. Where is it? Is it close to the binding site? And of course, there is again this whole threshold story. Is it close to the binding site? Well, it kind of looks like it is. Let's, let's just give it that, okay? It's close to the binding site. Next, structural effects. Um, remember this story? So I, 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 I'm gonna argue that I don't see a structural effect. Okay. So there's no structural effect. What's the third part? Yeah? Conservation. Conservation, thank you. Conservation, evolutionary conservation, in this particular case, you guys are used to logos, right? Okay, so you take a multiple sequence alignment, you compute a logo, here's the position we're interested in. Is this a problem? Is L23R a problem? Yeah. Why? Because L is the most uh, abundant uh, amino acid at that position, and I can't make out an R anywhere in the logo, so... 
So that would be surely a reason for yes. But I would argue that because the isoleucine and the methionine and the valine and the proline that I see in there are also somehow relevant, this site is actually okay, it's tolerant to substitutions. So I wouldn't necessarily strongly argue for the neutrality of the R, but I would say I don't know. Okay? Is that, is that a fair argument? The, you expect just one letter to be the... I don't know. This is thresholds. This is thresholds. I'm, I'm making these thresholds up for this example, which is also made up because I know what L23R is, right? So I'm just saying that this is scale, and on this scale, you have to make your decisions. Okay? All right. So the other thing that most people forget about is that these amino acids are not just conserved in the protein sequence, they also have their own biochemical properties, right? So for instance, L is an aliphatic amino acid, but on the other hand, the substituting amino acid is a charged positive polar amino acid, okay? And usually I can give you as a rule of thumb, if you substitute in or out a charged residue, you're probably going to have problems. Right, so that's as a rule of thumb. But again, that doesn't apply to every scenario, so we can't really make this comment. So the argument would be it's still, I don't know. Okay? But let's say these are the three things that we care about. And I tell you, this is a yes, this is a no, and this is an I don't know. So does this get you any closer to knowing that L23R is or is not a functional effect variant? No? No. So what we would do, hopefully, is capture someone who is smart enough to, to try to figure this out. Clearly not me, right? So I needed a, a machine learning thing for this, okay? And just, I, I realize that you guys are probably well familiar with this, but just to sort of point out, for any instance you can, let's say, have this three-dimensional three axis space of uh, structural effect, active site proximity, and conservation, and you can put any point on there, any variant on there, according to some value scale that you've just come up with for proximity and um, uh, destabilization and conservation, okay? You can put a point on there. And then you can put all points that you want on there. So here's the, the kicker. When I was putting this slide together, uh, there were points that were red and there were points that were blue and you were trying to separate red and blue. And for some reason, in this incarnation of PowerPoint, my red and blue filling and dots became red and blue outline. So you cannot see it, but trust me on this one, that you, what you do is in AI is try to separate them out in such a way that, that actually you get red separate from the, the blues. And, and these would have been red, but you know, PowerPoint. Okay, so what it basically means is that if I know that something is blue, experimentally I've shown it as blue, I can put it on a graph and if I've experimentally shown a red, I can put it on a graph, and I can separate these by some border, okay? And I can do it this way, and let's say I have another sample that's blue, I can do it this way, right? And then if I had another sample that's blue, I wouldn't change anything, and if I had a red, I would move it again, and so on and so forth, right? Everybody's familiar with this notion, right? You guys are okay with AI? Yeah, okay. So then the idea is uh, that supposedly, remember again, this has lost its color. Supposedly I've trained some instance to sort of separate these things out and uh, everything that's here is red. I'm just telling you so you know. <laughs> everything outside is blue. Um, so then if I come in with a thing that I wanted to predict, if I didn't know what it was, what would I call it? Points, huh? In this case, it should be blue. Yes, blue. And then this point would also be blue. Right, and so the one thing that I can also get from here is how far is it from the decision border, which also tells me how reliable my prediction is, right? So the further I am, the better it is. Okay, so for SNAP, we use the neural network. Lots of inputs of the type that would describe my conservation and my structural uh, disruptions and so on and so forth. And in the end, we had an output of a zero and a hundred in two output nodes. The top one was a hundred when it was non-neutral. 
and the bottom one was uh, 100 when it was neutral. And I computed the score as a difference between these nodes, so that anything below zero was neutral and anything above zero was not neutral. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So with all of these methods, it's very useful to evaluate them, right? And you guys have probably seen these types of curves, right? Where you compare the true positive rate versus the false positive rate. And what we showed for SNAP is that SNAP 2 was better than the original SNAP, which is in light blue, and then better than SIFT and better than Polyphen. How many of you here know what SIFT and Polyphen are? Nobody. Okay, uh, SIFT and Polyphen are methods for predicting functional effects of variance, just like SNAP is. And you know what? So are 88 of other methods. Right? So actually, this is a very well populated field. Okay? It wasn't when I started this. Right? There were three methods all together, including mine. And uh, you know, we, we sort of competed with each other. And that's why you had SIFT, Polyphon, and SNAP on it, because that, those were the three methods. Right now, we have 88. And these 88, we sort of summarized them in a brief, uh, in a brief overview here. So, the guys here are just a single feature learning machines, right? So SIFT only uses conservation as a prediction uh, tool. Foldex only uses structure, nothing else as a prediction. And then uh, these guys in the middle, including SNAP, have many features and machine learning and this, you know, all kinds of interesting ways of summing them up. And the guys on the right have just take all the outputs of all of these methods and throw them in together, right? So we tried everything. And you know what? Everybody does better than everybody else. There is MUD that does better than everybody else, Proviant that does better than everybody else, Polyphon that does better than everybody else, and Snap, and Metasnip, and we all do better than everybody else. How is that possible? Because we're using recall. When you do this in precision recall, it looks exactly the same, <laughs> only in the other direction. Um, so, Everybody does better than everybody else. This is wonderful because we don't fight, right? Uh, and, and so the idea is that obviously, and this is true of life, what, why do you have many methods to do the same thing? Because you haven't found an answer, right? The only reason you would build a new method to do the same thing is because the old one doesn't work. And the fact that these methods all perform very similarly is the reason that I can totally comfortable saying it just doesn't work, okay? All right, first of all, the reason why it doesn't work is because everybody relies on conservation. Everybody thinks that conservation is billions of years of experience in evolutionary history, so therefore it must have a message, and it does. Right? But it is the driving factor of all of these tools. Number two, because we are not really great at collecting experimental information, because it takes really a long time and a lot of money, everybody uses the same data sets. Even though they try to predict different things. One people will try to predict disease, one person will try to predict structural effects, another functional effects. You know, you ask, you read these papers, and I, I, this, is, this is the most amazing thing to me. You read these papers and you go, I have no idea what these people are predicting. They're saying they're predicting effect here, disease here, structure here, in the same paper, right? So they're predicting everything. And you go to the author and you go, what are you predicting? And people started hating me at conferences. I'm like, what are, what are you predicting? Effect. What does that mean? You wrote the paper, what does it mean? You know, what are you trying to predict? They don't know. And they don't know because we have the same data sets and uh, we use them for all kinds of purposes, right? Just generalized effect will give you the overlap of all of these, of impact on molecular function, of pathogenicity and evolutionary fitness, which are the three things we care about, right? And that overlap, if you recall this slide, is huge. This is why you can use the same data sets to make all of these predictions, because you will get a good performance, about 75%, as you saw on the curves, right? 75% in all cases. But you cannot do the things that are outliers. Okay. And uh, just to sort of drive this point home, 
These two lines, the red and the green, are the distribution of conservation scores across uh, disease sets. So these are disease variants. These, the black and the blue, are the conservation against all variants that we observe on normal people. So if we make the assumption that most people are not sick, just as a general rule, this is uh, healthy variants, not disease associated, and these are disease associated. And what we see is, in fact, most of the disease variants are conserved, as the arrow is pointing right, to. However, there is a really large fraction which is not conserved. Right? And what to make matters worse, there is a large fraction of the variants which are not disease associated, which are conserved. Right? So you can't use conservation just directly the way you want to. And the same thing goes for structure. So if you look at disease variants and you say, okay, um, disease variants destabilize, you will see that this and this, these are the subset of disease variants which destabilize the protein. Great, right? It's a large fraction, except that there is also this bunch of disease variants that don't destabilize the protein. They do it somehow else, right? And then if you look at the entire set, if you look at the non-disease set, you will see that actually uh, there is variants here that destabilize the protein that are not disease associated. So again, structure can't also be used directly to drive information. So in the end, what you're trying to do is in some feature space separate out variants that have an effect or have no effect, right? But what does having an effect mean, right? Is it disease? Is it function? Is it, what, what is it, right? And the problem with us defining an effect is not the problem of us defining the effect, it's the problem of us defining no effect. And let me argue this point. And we already started arguing it in the morning. <laughs> so the idea is this. Are there any red cars in the world? Oh, yes, the answer is yes, right? There are red cars in the world. Okay, are there any yellow cars in the world? Sure. How do you know? In this world. In this world. Oh, in that one. Uh... So, I don't know, let me check. Here's more of that world. Are there any yellow cars? Now? 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 And I can keep going, and at some point I'm gonna need to stop because I run out of funds and time and interest and, and I don't want to do this anymore. But I still don't know if there are any yellow cars in the world. So it's very easy to say there is an effect. It's extremely easy to say that. If you see it once, there is an effect. That's it. You can argue about, okay, maybe the experiment was wrong. You do it again, you see the same thing, there is an effect, okay? But it's very hard to say there is no effect, okay? Because effect comes in all shapes and sizes. So in the end, all of these methods are trained to do this, or should be trained, they're not trained to do this, but they should be trained to do this. The yellow line here is the distribution of the variance along the feature scale that we observe with no labels, right? So just the variance, but we know that underlying this yellow distribution is some set of effect variants and some set of no effect variants. We don't know what that distribution is, but we know it's underlying. And so the right way to do it is to do positive unlabeled training, where you basically say, I have effect variants and I know what the distribution of those is and I need to be able to subtract them from my distribution of the variants overall in order to be able to say this is effect and this is well unlabeled right so it's not no effect because we never could do this on a per variant basis we could only do this on distribution basis okay and basically it comes down to estimating the priors these alphas of what are these alphas of the distributions and actually, if anybody is interested, uh, Peja Predra Gradivoic, who is currently visiting TUM and will be giving a talk next week on Tuesday, um, he is the guy behind both of these papers that solved that problem. It's great. They just put it together, they published it in 2016. That means that the 88 methods of ovarian effect predictions have not yet used it. Okay? So. This is going to be coming, and, and it's going to work, I think, somehow. But um, it hasn't happened yet. 
So none of the current tools use positive unlabeled training. Everybody uses positive and negative. So how do they know what is negative? Right? So most often as positive, they will use non-neutrals, these monogenic disorders, variants that cause monogenic disease, Mendelian disease. Okay? They will say these are most likely non-neutral and they will most likely be correct, although that not, not always. Okay? As I said, we all carry around some variants which are bona fide monogenic disorder variants and we're still okay. All right? Okay, and as a non-neutral, what they use is this non-conserved positions in multiple sequence alignments. And again, that's an issue, as I mentioned before, right? So in the end, what you have is disease versus conservation and orthologs, which is not something that you want to be training your method to do, because what you're trying to do is either predict disease or no disease, or function or no function. Is that clear to everybody? Yes? Yes? Okay. So we didn't use positive unlabeled training for SNAP. This was way before I met Predrag. and But it still works for very many variants. And one of the reasons that it works is because the variants that we used weren't that set. They were experimentally determined variants. So we went to a database where people actually read papers and from literature extracted experimental effects. This is a very painstaking job. And this is why nobody does it now anymore. Right? So unfortunately that database has not grown, but we used it to train the method and this allows us to do some computational experiments which other people cannot do. Okay? So we are again focusing on function. We know what we are predicting. So we are going to predict functional effect. Okay? So again, just as a reminder of SNAP scoring, the idea is that um, you have the idealized neutral and the idealized non-neutral, the, the blue line and the red line over there, but you never actually have that. So what you have is a distribution of scores from minus 100 to zero, which are neutral, and from zero to 100 that are non-neutral. So then I asked, how well can we do in predicting the data set that we trained on, right? So this is not a new data set. Machine learning methods should do really well on the things that they've trained on, right? So can you tell if we do well? So either you don't understand what's on the board or you don't know machine learning if you can't answer that question. Which is it? Does everybody understand what's on the board? No. Okay. So this is the score, right? So everything to the left of zero is supposed to be neutral, and anything to the right of zero is supposed to be non-neutral. The red variants are severe functional effect variants, right? Are we predicting those correctly? Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, so 75%, right? <laughs> More or less, 80%, something like that. Does everybody see this? Yes? So what you do is you count the area under the curve here and here and everything on the right is correct because there are severe functional effects and they're predicted as having an effect. Right? And everything on the left is incorrect because there are severe functional effects that are predicted as not having an effect. Yes? Yeah. Is every point one variant or what? No, this is the fraction of variance. So every point is a score along the snap score axis. Okay? All right. So then the things on the left are the things that are supposed to be neutral. So these are the so-called synonymous variants where I don't actually replace the amino acid by anything. I just leave it to be the way it was. And I ask my neural network to predict that. And then there's these ortholog variants in light blue. So this is where I say, uh, just give me the prediction from the orthology, right? So th this is an alignment. And what we see is that we do really okay. This is different than this, right? So if all of my predictions were like this, I would be in the clear. And so the idea is that these guys are prediction errors, 
right? Because there is no effect of these variants that have no substitution. And these guys are possible prediction errors because there is always room for experimental error as well, okay? So remember, again, SNAP is trained yes or no. So then we asked, what happens if we uh, make predictions for mild and moderate and severe variants, okay? Experimentally mild and moderate and severe. And what we see is a very clear shift of this curve to the left toward the neutral side. So the reds are the severes, the purple are the moderates, and the pink are the mild variants. Why do you think this happens? I trained the method to recognize yes or no. I did not train it to recognize effect. Some yes, but why? What is the biological source or the experimental source of this? It's of the effect, and so it's where along the threshold we are. Yes, but I didn't train the method to do this. It learned on its own. Why? Well, you use the neural net, right? Yeah. Uh, the neural net learned to recognize certain features and it translated them into this quantitative measurement that you took. The yes or no that comes from the two scores, 100 and 100, and those final notes. And so some of these notes started recognizing partial features. Right, uh, that's, that's one answer, and that's the answer I like to stick by. The, the truth is probably somewhere between that and the fact that mild effects are seriously hard to recognize. So remember, and this is this uh, reliability score, right? We're talking about this is what the score is. Um, and here's what it manifests in, in reality into. So how, which, which mice, can you reliably tell me which mouse has darker fur? Reliably, please. Yeah? How reliably can you tell me this? Anybody? <laughs> yeah? Well, if you had to put a number on the reliability of your answer, what would that be? 100%. Okay, wonderful. What about these two? Still. Oh, well, it depends on the lighting. Yeah, it depends on the lighting and the angle. So how reliable would that be? Zero. I don't know about zero, but maybe 50, right? 25%. And actually, it could be 25% and you could be right or wrong in either direction. So, you know, that's, that's exactly what, I, what the neural network has memorized. So when an experimentalist runs an experiment, if it's a severe effect, if you can clearly see that effect, that's a yes, there is a functional effect. What if it's a tiny little effect? What if it's a two-fold or a three-fold or a half-fold, right? What are those things? And you know, one experimentalist will say, yeah, this is neutral. And the other one will say, yeah, this is not neutral. And when you learn, when your machine learning learns those instances as being in one case neutral and in one case not neutral, that's what it recognizes. Do you see? Okay, so it not only, it probably does some of its inference on its own in the features, which I hope is true, because that means that we've really trained the machine learning device. But I also think that a large fraction of it is the fact that we use these uh, flexible data, unreliable data from experimentalists to do this. Okay? Okay, so the severity of the effect actually correlates really well was the reliability of the effect, of the prediction. So, where do you think the experimental neutrals fall? Remember that conversation about how difficult it is to establish whether something is neutral or not? Where do you think they fall? Come on. Sometimes around the zero. Yeah, so somewhere like that. So half the time they're right, half the time they're not really right. Looks like uh, the mild effects moved over to the side a little bit, yeah? 
So the idea is that the neutrals, the experimental neutrals as compared to these idealized neutrals that I was showing you before, are very, very difficult to establish. And there is a couple of reasons. It's not because experimentalists hate us, although this is you know, probably some effect. But the idea is that the first problem is that the variant selection is biased. So this is a quote from, from a collaborator of mine. And he says, we're going to investigate effect of variance. And in order to investigate these variants, we're going to get a morbidly obese cohort. And we're going to look for variants that are different between this cohort, these morbidly obese people, and the normal people. And we are going to evaluate those variants. So this is bias. This is basically saying I'm looking for the variants that are going to be problematic. Okay? This is number one. Nobody goes out and says, let me find variants that have no effect. Nobody does this, right? Um, says something about our culture here. So the idea is that you get six panels worth of data, and only one of those panels, almost as an afterthought, says, oh, and by the way, these two variants, threonine 11 serine and arginine 18 cysteine, in expression data look pretty much, uh, sorry, in agonist binding data look pretty much like wild type. There is no difference, okay? That's great. There is no difference. I got our neutrals, right? The problem is that a year later, these guys do this analysis. So this was agonist binding. These guys now do this analysis, same exact protein, same exact variants, and they're measuring constitutive activity. It's a different type of activity that this protein has. And guess what? These two variants, threonine 11 serine and arginine 18 cysteine, show up as being functionally significant. So all of a sudden, it's the same group that does the research, right? And all of a sudden, these variants are no longer neutral. You see? So actually, experimental workup is very often incomplete, and that's the story of trying to find the yellow car. I can keep going and going and going. And then also, of course, there is this effect identification, which is subjective. If you look here, uh, the, you know, at this concentration, which is normal concentration for certain situations, this variant is neutral, but the moment you go up to this concentration, right, it's not neutral anymore. So it also very much depends on the environment in which you're looking. And we don't take environment into consideration when we make our predictions, okay? So in the end, if you took experimental variants and you ask them, are they functionally significant? Remember that blue curve distribution? Those are the neutral variants. Well, it appears that actually half of them either disrupt structure, destabilize uh, the structure, or cause disease. So I would be very unsure about how, how reliable the identification of them as being neutral with respect to function is. Is that clear? Yes? Okay. So experimental neutrals are not really neutrals. And this is, this is a big finding because we as computational biologists, as bioinformaticians, are taught to say that experimental work is the gold standard. But the reality of it is that the experimental work is not the gold standard, right? They make errors. They don't do work completely. They can't do work completely. So their data is as valuable as ours. So when you see something like this, you kind of go, oh, well, maybe we should reconsider. Okay, and um, the reason why we should reconsider is because is that has direct effect on how we see disease. So we're now back in the disease world, right? Uh, the light red rhombi here represent disease variants, right? So they're actual disease variants and they distribute very much like the severe mutations in our data set. On the other hand, the variants that we call polymorphic are actually here and they distribute actually even slightly to the right of what we call neutral, right? So polymorphisms are not neutral. And I don't know why people are so surprised about this, because if you look around the room, you don't see your clone, you don't see your twin. The difference between people in this room is in their polymorphisms, right? This is the things that are not disease causing, but they're going to have an effect, right? They're going to have an effect on function. So 
This leads me to this next point. Many methods that are out there will try to recognize disease variants versus ortholog variants, right? And here it's like a toggle. It's either on or off. There is no intermediate anywhere. And unfortunately that doesn't always work. As I said here the disease variants are very often conserved and the, what they call orthologous variants are non-conserved by definition. So what you're trying to differentiate is not conserved from conserved in some super roundabout way. In a way where you put other labels on it and try to differentiate that. Um, the problem is that there is um, error on either side, right? So there is those variants right there which are of, of no disease effect, right? But they're conserved. And so those variants are very likely on a scale, on a spectrum of this rheostatic functional. So it's not an on or off, it's a little bit change or more change. Does that make sense? On the other hand, you also have the error on the other side. So this is a very interesting figure. Uh, this large chunk, this, this yellow circle that you don't really see, is an alignment of 24 million variants between 100 um, vertebrate species that are very close to human, right? So this is a multiple sequence alignment of more or less 100 proteins per protein and there's 24 million, um, 100, sorry, 100 sequences per protein and there's 24 million variants there. And if you look at those 24 million, and what you see is that most of them are actually not, you know, that important, but you get 2100 plus 313 plus 530 variants which are identified by one database or another as being disease. Right? And these variants, in order to be identified as disease, they have to be monogenic disease variants. So really, these are real disease variants, okay, we're talking about. And the idea here is that, um, you know, if you walk around with them, there must be something else going on. So there must be compensation going on, right? That's one example of, of what's happening. And the smallest estimate that we get is that 3% of the variants that are different across species are actually disease associated in humans, at least 3%. But in reality, it's probably 12, right? So it's somewhere between them. And that again brings me to this point. What's okay for yeast may not be okay for humans, right? Okay, in this case it's vertebrate. So what's okay for a chimp and not be okay for human? Okay, so there's a different level of functionality. Again, variance disrupting function but not affecting disease. So in this case, off is not what it was. It's an often Mendelian disease variant and an on is an amino acid from an orthologous sequence and that is a scheme which is very different from this toggle version, right? But to be sure, there are oppositions in the proteins that are toggles, okay? So for instance here, what you see is this position tyrosine 47 and position valine 52, right? This is a LAC1 repressor from E. coli and you see that anything that you put into this position will kill the function, right? Some more than others, so this is roughly, I don't know, 30 fold and this is all of it, right? But here you can actually see a staircase where the wild type is in the middle, right? So this is a rheostat position, the right position. Left position is a toggle position. And so what do you expect if you were making predictions for these toggle and rheostat positions? So now we have four things to consider. We could be a toggle position neutral so no effect, a toggle position non-neutral effect. So that's the dark blue and the dark red. And then you have a rheostat position neutral, which has no effect, and a rheostat position non-neutral, which has a range of effect. Is that clear? Right? Okay. This is what you expect. Now the reason why neutrals are about the same is because neutral, you cannot be neut more neutral or less neutral than something else, right? You either are neutral at a threshold or you're not. On the other hand, the fact can have a range, okay? So, what do you expect? You expect this, what do you get? Completely different things, okay? So this is four of the best methods that are out there. And uh, what you are comparing here is neutrals in toggle positions versus non-neutrals in rheostat positions. And non-neutrals, the effect variants here are predicted to be less damaging than neutrals in toggle positions. 
Does that make sense? Not at all, right? This is a complete reversal of what you expect. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Or no? Well, I don't. Okay, great. So, this is, this is what we expect. This is rheostat position, not neutral variance. And this is rheostat position neutral variance, right? So no effect, effect, right? This effect is ranged because it could be anywhere from zero to 100, right? So this is a rheostat position. This is a toggle position. So no effect and effect, right? But here it's on or off, so there is no range. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. So both rheostat and toggle non-neutrals should be not neutral. And both rheostat and toggle neutrals should be neutral. Okay, so this is what we see. We're now comparing neutrals in uh, toggle positions to non-neutrals in rheostat positions. And what we're seeing is that toggle neutrals get higher scores. They're predicted as more damaging than rheostat non-neutrals. Is that is that clear? Yeah. Which is wrong, obviously, right? So it, it, it's wrong, we can't do this. Um, you can argue that the p-value of this is, is not significant, right? But that makes it worse, if not better, right? So there is no difference between neutrals and non-neutrals as long as they're in different types of positions. Okay, next thing that we tried to predict, which was very surprising, I thought at least within a position it should be able to do this. And this is a difference between rheostat neutrals and non-neutrals. And again, there is no difference, right? This is your p-value. Okay, Provian, one method actually gets, good, gets significance there. But you could see that the overlap between these is pretty, pretty dire, okay? And then if you ask on the same thing, the same thing on the toggle position, say, you completely lose it, right? There is absolutely no difference between those, whether they're neutral or non-neutral. We cannot differentiate them, okay? So then you can ask like, another question. Well, if all neutrals are supposed to be the same, can we differentiate neutrals in toggle positions from the, non, uh, from the neutrals in rheostat positions? And guess what? We can, which is... Crazy, right? All neutrals, no effect is supposed to be no effect. So the only thing about the only two things that, that these methods can do is they can, re they, they can differentiate rheostat non-neutrals from toggle non-neutrals. So they can differentiate the ones that are super severe from the ones which are not, which is good. And then the other thing that they can differentiate is the thing that they were trained to do. They can differentiate toggle non-neutrals, these really sick, really bad disease variants from rheostat neutrals, which are usually these non-conserved position mild variants, right? And that we do really well at, and this is where derive, we derive the majority of our accuracy, okay? So because these are the variants that we deal with most of the time, we do really well overall. But you've seen that we don't do really well in predicting the other differentiations, okay? So, um, because we can do this, we can do a very cool experiment. You gotta rescue some of it, right? So, well, you can do a really cool experiment and you can say, common variants in the human population versus rare variants in the human population. Which one do you expect to be functionally significant? And every time I come out with this question, people usually say, well, of course, the rare variants will be more functionally significant, right? Except that's not true. The common variants are more functionally significant than the rare variants, and the reason for this is, anybody? No? So, one ethnicity is different from another ethnicity on the basis of their common variants, right? So the same position, different variant. So in African Americans, you're gonna have one version. In Caucasians, another version. In Chinese Han, another version, right? These are the things that differentiate us. These are common variants. They're common per population, not common overall. Does that make sense? So they're going to be the ones that differentiate us, but not even on an ethnicity scale, just an everyday scale. You don't walk around with diseases in 95% of the population. 
you, most people are healthy, but they're all very different. So the common variants are the ones that are responsible for the differences that are not disease associated. But what we are used to thinking about is disease. And disease variants are usually rare, right? Great, they're rare. So the idea is that function is not equivalent to disease and you have to stop thinking of disease as function, okay? So um, one more thing that comes out of it is that you can correlate our scores to expectation, uh, to expectation, yeah. So the white line here is the variance that we observe in the human population. Uh, the blue and the red are the variants that I generated that are not real variants that by simply mutating every single position in a bunch of proteins to every other amino acid. And you can divide that set into SNP possible and SNP impossible mutations. And I like to focus on the ones that are SNP possible, the blue line. So the blue line is really where, what are the expected random SNPs. So if there was no selection pressure, you can have an expectation, right, for random SNPs. And the white line is the observed SNPs in healthy individuals. And you can see that they differ. And the reason why they differ is because of this notion that biochemically not neutral, something that has a functional effect, does not have to be under selection pressure is not making you sick, it's not killing you, it's not under selection pressure. So this stuff is wild type, this stuff is selected against the things in the green, and these things are the ones where this is the evolutionary playground, right? Why would evolution want to have functionally non-neutral variants around? For, um, well, as part of an uh, evolutionary buffer? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, absolutely. Cryptic variants. Cryptic? Variants. They're not cryptic. They're, they're evolutionary buffer, right? Evolutionary buffer in case a virus comes and decides to wipe us all out. We need somebody who will survive that virus as a population, right? Um, in case you live in Africa and you know you need an uh, increased amount of melanin in your skin as opposed to a decreased amount of melanin in the northern Europe where you need exposure to sunlight in order to generate uh, the essential amino acids which you can't get any other way. Right? So, so this is the idea. You have some functional needs and necessities which are environment specific and you can't eliminate them. They're not going to be under this selection pressure that kills out everything. But you don't want them to be here because everything that's broken needs to go. Does that make sense? Okay. So just to sort of summarize some conclusions. This is not what most people understand happens, but healthy people carry a lot of functionally significant variants. So in fact, at least a fifth and a, probably closer to 45% of the variants that you have are functionally significant, right? So they have an effect. Um, selection is restrained from removing functionally non-neutral variants because it needs a playground, more or less. And common variants of healthy individuals affect protein function as much or more than rare ones. Now, this is a hot point of debate. I've only come up with these conclusions two years ago, and I've had, I don't know, maybe 200 conversations about this, telling me how wrong I am. Um, but the reality is that it, it makes sense, and there is, should be no reason why this should be not the case biologically, except that most people associate function with disease. And then if you do that, then you say that common variants are responsible for disease, and this is not true, okay? And then the other thing is that wet lab fails to identify many functionally significant variants. So if a wet lab biologist come to you, comes to you and says, your method is crap because you, know, you don't do well on my, my variants, well, you can tell them to uh, go and think about this a little more. <laughs> and then the final idea is that polymorphisms could contribute to disease. Okay? And so uh, the most important conclusions here, if you don't walk away with anything but that, evolution as reflected in conservation is not the only defining factor of importance. Rare variation is not equal to disease or to functional significance. Common variation, it does not mean that something is functionally neutral. Uh, functional or structural significance of variants does not necessarily lead to disease. Structural significance of variants does not equal functional significance of the variants. And most current methods are not independent and thus give the same results.
right? Um, so you can't say I'm going to take two methods and look for their overlap makes no sense, okay? And very importantly for anything in your life, you should know what you're doing, right? You should know exactly what you're trying to predict. So to sort of make this point with a functional baggage story, you know the saying, the last straw broke the camel's back? You could see that the brick is already broken before the straw hits it. All right, so by the time you develop disease, you already have been predisposed to disease for a very long time, in fact, your entire lifetime. So this does not work, right? Looking for that one variant that's disease causing is not going to work in most cases. So that's it. Uh, this is the people who did the work. And that's it. Thank you.